Hi, welcome to iRebel on the Voluntary Virtues Network. I'm Meredith and I'm here with Sarah and we thank you for joining us today. Um, hi Good Sarah. Morning. Good morning Meredith. So today we're going to talk about a really interesting topic. Um, it's, you know, we've, we've all heard of, the, well, most of us have heard of the Stanford Prison Experiment um, and even the Milgram Experiment, but there's a little known experiment that took place in California that we want to talk about. Um, so it's, it, this experiment took place in April of 1967. It was done at Coverly High School in Palo Alto, California, and uh, it's called the Third Wave. Um, and the name comes from beach lore in which the Third Wave is the last and most powerful. Uh, it was done by a teacher named uh, Ron Jones, and it started with a question from a student. And the question, he was teaching uh, World War II at the time, so they were working on uh, in Nazi Germany. And one student asked, how could the German people so easily follow Adolf Hitler? Which I think is a question that all of us have had. Um, so he set out to answer that. Um, so. I'm just going to go over briefly the rules of the experiment. Uh, it was a week long. It was a week long experiment. Um, and in this time, he was, before this, a pretty lax teacher. Uh, so he had this specific model that I'll talk about in a minute of teaching. Um, but it, for this experiment, he forbid them to use his first name because often they would just call him Ron. So this time he said they are to always address him as Mr. Jones. And um, so if they actively participated in the party, they would get an A. Um, so, okay, let me back up. He's, he's setting up sort of this experimental new political party with them, and they knew that. So that was what they were doing. Um, so he said if they participated, par actively participated in the party, they would get an A. If they passively participated in the party, they would get a C. And if they tried to start a revolution and failed, they would get an F. But if they tried to start a revolution and won, they would get an A. And just a side note on this, this uh, was an affluent high school. All the kids there were, came from, you know, uh, you know, homes with money. They, they had goals to get to a good college. Um, so that's, that's kind of important when you're thinking about this. Mm -hmm. um, so one girl, one student said uh, he, that he wrote on the board, those who go yeah. along with the experiment will get an A, and those who don't will get, and then he left that blank. So just, that was a little bit scary for them. Um, this kind of, she said it was kind of a threatening thing. Um, so, also, uh, when answering a question, they would have to stand to, at the side of their desk and preface each question, uh, or basically anything they said, with Mr. Jones. And, interestingly, their answers had to be three words or less. Um, so, and evidently, they loved this. They, they picked it up right away. Um, Students were rewarded for making an effort in answering or asking questions, and so they started to actively participate more. Um, he created a salute and had them use it each time they saw each other, even off campus. And so the salute was a curved, uh, curved hand signaling a wave like this. Um, and so... Uh, we're just going to go into the synopsis of, of how it worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, students who questioned the experiment were banished. Oh, yes, that too. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. So the first day he called Strength Through Discipline, and he had them sit at attention with their hands behind their back and sat with their feet squarely on the floor. He told them that this was to improve circulation and attention, and he had them try it, and they all agreed they felt... Their brains were clearer. They could think more clearly, more quickly. Uh, they played a game in which they learned to do militaristic style timed drills to get to their seat. They also did noise drills in which talking was allowed only to be shown as a, as a detraction. Following minutes of progressive drill assignments, the class could move from standing positions outside the room to attention sitting positions at their desks without making a sound. The maneuver took five seconds. 
Day two was strength through community. The idea of the group being more important than the individual. Ron Jones, they did chanting and stomping feet. Uh, he suggested that they get a class grade instead of an individual grade. Um, after that, they started studying together. Some students liked it because they didn't have to study, and others didn't because they thought that their grades might be compromised. He handed out ID cards written on index cards and assigned a few students the role of informant. More people were informing than were given the role, which is interesting. Uh, day three was strength through action. Uh, Ron Jones says, I discussed the beauty, believing so thoroughly in yourself and your community or family that you will do anything to preserve, protect, and extend that being. I stressed how hard work and allegiance to each other would allow accelerated learning and accomplishment. I reminded students of what it felt like being in classes where competition caused pain and degradation. Students in situations in which students were pitted against each other in everything from gym to reading. The feeling of never acting, never being a part of something, never supporting each other. The students started coming up with ideas for their party and their teacher went with them. They made posters, pictures, and flyers. They began a campaign to enlist other students and they dubbed Strength Through Unity and sat at tables with forms. There was a tension and the students started to physically fight in the hallway. Many students acted in an elitist manner. The enlistment worked well, though, and the classes grew to standing room only. Yeah. People started giving Mr. Jones a great deal of information about all of his students. Students' reactions ranged from fanatical to blind conformity in order to fit in, to fear of their fellow classmates who may inform on them. Mr. Jones started holding in-class trials of students who had violated any rule. If found guilty, the students were banished to the library. Accounts vary, but at least one student asked to be the bodyguard for Mr. Jones, and he accepted. A Gestapo was formed by the other students. Hmm. So um, that was the end of day three. And on day four, um, when they came into the classroom, it had been vandalized. Uh, the accounts of this vary, uh, so we don't quite know who vandalized or why. Um, but when he came in, he closed the curtains and turned off the lights and held mock assassinations where certain students were expelled from the class, much like, you know, the student banished again to the library. Um, and he told the students that were left that this was not a game and that everyone that hadn't been banished would be part of a new and real political youth movement party and that the next day this information would be announced nationally. Uh, one of the students asked about a random ad in a magazine that said something like, the third wave is coming, which is interesting. Um, and Mr. Jones had no prior knowledge of this, but he saw it and he took it and he used the ad as backup to his story and told the students that there would be a rally the next day where they would be able to meet their national party leader, not in person, on, on the TV, they would see this party leader. So they were instructed not to talk about the assembly or the national youth movement outside of the classroom. And then uh, this is into the fifth day. Uh, the students were the students were escorted into the to the rally in an assembly hall. Two students refused to go. Uh, and all in all there were approximately 200 students in this rally. Um, so it, it grew to re a really big size by, at that point. So Mr. Jones had hired actors to play journalists and photographers. They were circling the room. You know, the students really thought this was real. Um, there were bodyguards at the doors. He had, so when they came in there, he had everyone stand at attention and chant with an increasing intensity, starting at a whisper, um, strength through discipline, strength through community, strength through action, until it was at a fevered pitch. And then he instructed them to wait for the party leader to come on the TV that he had placed in the front of the room. They were left alone to stare at snow on the screen. Time passed and no leader appeared. According to student accounts, there, there was a panic um, after this. They're staring at the screen and nothing is happening, so the students started to panic uh, because there was already this fear you know, about this. And this is the fifth day and, and there's lots of fear involved in this. Um, so 
uh, they started to run for the doors to try and escape from the room. And I remember one student said he fully expected the door to be locked. Um, so when Mr. Jones saw this, he turned on the lights and turned off the screen. Uh, and then he turned on a projection screen in, you know, farther in the back of the room. And he showed images of Germany during Nazi rule. And then he gave a short speech in which he told the students that they showed to be no better or worse than the German people during World War II, thereby answering the original question. Uh, this was hard on the students. They, a lot of them were sobbing. They didn't know what to do. They were visibly shocked and horrified. Um, so uh, that was the end. It, it took five days, uh, but it was a big, big deal. It had you know, ripple effects. Um, throughout the school year and throughout the, the lives of the children, they actually, I, I didn't put this in there, but um, he instructed them not to talk about it. Um, just, and, and a lot of them didn't want to talk about it anyway because of the extreme guilt that they felt for being part of this. Once they realized what was going on, they felt manipulated and totally guilty for being part of it. So he told them not to talk about it after it was revealed? Right. And the they did Okay. Yes. Uh, they, he felt guilty too. Was the thing mm. that he he got wrapped up in it as well. He mm -hmm. took on the role of dictator easily, and when he saw the students, I mean, their grades improved, their their participation improved. They were really model students after this, and um, so he felt so, so he his personality changed. Um, and his wife noticed and uh, was very concerned about this and vocal about mm -hmm. it. And uh, so I feel like he felt very guilty too. And uh, and he he realized that this was dangerous. There was there were a lot of fights inside and outside of school between the students who were part of the wave and the students who weren't. There was this elitist mm -hmm. attitude going on. Um, kids were told told by the, the the children that were participating in in the third wave were very sort of bullying to the kids who weren't mm -hmm. um, so this he recognized the danger that he that he created with this and it, it was a formerly a pretty laid-back um, high school and especially his class was um, so that was interesting. So yeah, they did not talk about it. They didn't. They actually didn't talk about it until at least ten years later, at least, but most longer than that. So um, there was a little bit of opposition. Uh, like I said, there were two students that refused to go to the assembly when I mean when it came time to go. They they stuck with it, but then they they couldn't bring themselves to participate in this assembly once they. They thought it was a real thing, um, but originally one of the students uh, he banished her right away. She she spoke up right away and noticed that this was not okay. So he banished her to the library, and uh, once she got to the library, she was so shaken by what she'd seen that she had this drive to secretly because she was afraid too all the kids were afraid but she wanted to secretly bring awareness to the class activities so she started making posters she didn't know what else to do I mean she's a girl in high school so she went home and started making posters and would go in the evening she went in the evening and hung them in the in the halls after school but by the next morning and this is after the first day actually so she was banished the first day and mm -hmm. then she made the posters and when she got back to this the, the morning of the next day they were all taken down Right. Um, so she, her resolve strengthened and she went home and made more posters and grabbed a ladder and lugged a ladder to school and hung them up as high as she could and um, she did that every day after that because a lot of them were taken down not all of them I mean some of them were left up they were up high but um, so every day she would go and hang more posters up and interestingly she signed the posters the breakers so she 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 kind of made herself sound like an organization the breakers and I think it was after a wave the break wave yes yes so it, it was actually she said um, it was the name of a vacation home or some kind of chateau oh. that she had known as a child and she thought it was perfect because yes the breakers you know the wave it breaks the wave right mm -hmm. so, 
she signed at the breakers so this made it look like it was more than just her that there was a bigger opposition and even the teacher they were they were you know wondering who this was it was a big mystery and even the teacher didn't know that it was this girl and she was wow. terrified that that somebody would find her out um, and I can see why mm -hmm. uh, so um, that was the opposition I mean you know kudos to her uh, two years later Ron Jones was let go as a teacher over this and I think a few other things um, his teaching style uh, was was different um, and he was never allowed to teach high school again which is interesting too um, right. and then ten years later upon running into it was the first time he'd run into any of his former students that were partic that participated in the third wave. He ran into a student and they talked for a while and he decided it was time to write down his account of the experiment. And actually uh, we came across that. We had that. So we'll link that in. in. Mm -hmm. We'll link that below the video so you guys can check that out too. And from that account um, it was made into a lot of different mediums. Uh, one of them was a book that is actually now requi required reading in Germany and parts of Israel and the US. Um, so all of Germany is required to read that in high school and some, some schools in Israel and some schools in the US. Um, also there was an award-winning German movie called The Wave which is how you and I Mm -hmm. found out about this. It's a great movie. Um, we encourage everybody to watch it. it it's award-winning for a reason. It's really good. Yeah, uh, we watched it on Netflix, right? Yeah, yeah, right. It's available on Netflix. It's fantastic. Um, and it's it's really, it stays remarkably true to the story. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's really cool, too. Um, and then there was an after-school special called The Wave as well. Right, so it's another documentary. It was mm -hmm. earlier in the '70s. This was made. Um, I'm not sure. I think I think the German movie was like 2009, something like that. 2008. Mm -hmm. 2008. Um, so this was the the after school special was made in the '70s. So it was it was called the Wave. Um, and then yeah. there, yeah. To, and then there was a documentary about it with uh, with Ron Jones, the teacher, with students who were in the class, and with Philip Zimbardo called lesson plan mm -hmm. uh, that was also very interesting and, and watching the different ones gives you a lot more insight into what it was and and what was going on um, right right yeah uh, so dr. Philip Zimbardo is well known for the Stanford prison experiment um, which was a study of psychological effects of becoming a prisoner or a prison guard the experiment was conducted at Stanford University from August 14th to the 20th in 1971 by a team of researchers led by psychology professor Philip Zimbardo. It was funded, interestingly, by the U.S. Office of Naval Research and was of interest to both the U.S. Navy and the Marine Corps as an investigation into the causes of conflict between military guards and prisoners. Uh, 24 male students out of 75 were selected to take on randomly assigned roles of prisoner and guards in a mock prison situation uh, in the basement of the Stanford Psychology Building. The participants adapted to their roles well beyond Zimbardo's expectations as the guards enforced authoritarian measures and ultimately subjected some of the prisoners to psychological torture. Many of the prisoners passively accepted psychological abuse and at the end of the guards at the, at the request of the guards, readily harassed other prisoners who attempted to prevent it. The experiment even affected Zimbardo himself, who in his role as a superintendent permitted the abuse to continue. Two of the prisoners quit the experiment early and the entire experiment was abruptly stopped after only six days. Certain portions of the experiment were filmed and ex excerpts of footage are publicly available. Um, so there's some similarities between the WAVE and the Stanford Prison Experiment. Uh, they're similar in that they both took place with a teacher at the helm of the school setting, in a school setting. Uh, both experiments were ended by a person close to the teacher that noticed changes in the leader or teacher. Uh, Ron Jones' wife actually noticed changes in him and brought it to his attention that he needed to put a stop to it. And that was when he decided to do it his own way through the assembly, right. essentially. 
Uh, and Phillips and Barda's girlfriend, he brought her down into the basement to show her what was going on, and she was horrified. Yeah. And he was so wrapped up in it himself, and he admits this um, and talks about it at length, that um, you know it took somebody else, like a, an outsider, looking in to say, this is absolutely not okay. Um, they both involve obedience, control, and authority as themes. And in both the WAVE and the Stanford Prison Experiment, one or more participants at some point refused to participate further. So we, you did have those, those participants that spoke out early. Mm -hmm. And I think another, um, another similarity is these roles so readily taken on, it's about power. Mm -hmm. um, so in the Stanford Prison Experiment, uh, the, the people who were given power, the, the guards, um, took that on at, way above and beyond what Phillips and Bardo even thought. And they were all just students, and they all knew it was just an experiment. Mm -hmm. And uh, conversely, the prisoners, which is even more strange, really took on the roles of prisoners. They really felt like prisoners. They really felt trapped, even though they knew they could leave. Um, and so... It, it seems to be a reminder of the extremely, and especially because both teachers got wrapped up into it too, it's mm -hmm. a reminder of the extremely corrupting, uh, you know, the, cor the corruption that power brings to people really quickly too. Um, mm -hmm. I know that the Stanford prison experiment was supposed to go on for two weeks and it only lasted six days. Right. Um, yeah, and the, the wave only lasted five days. Right, and who knows how long the wave would have continued because it was sort of a spontaneous, which brings us to the differences, with one of, some of the differences between the two experiments. Uh, the Stanford Prison Experiment was, of course, paid volunteers. They were paid to participate while the wave was spontaneous and conducted within classrooms of compulsory government schools. And the Stanford Prison Experiment was conducted as a government-funded experiment that was carefully planned out. Uh, the way this portrayed as a spontaneous lesson plan sparked by a student's question about World War II and the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And I think um, one other difference is uh, this: the Stanford Prison Experiment obviously is showing prison uh, pr a prison environment. It's really taking that that power dynamic and and looking into that very closely, whereas the wave, the third wave, is more of sort of a collectivist kind of thing. So, like a, on a national scale, they 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 didn't they didn't actually point out these people are your underlings. They just kind of took that on themselves. But there were no, they didn't have prisoners to look over, and you know nobody was assigned the role of inferiority. Um, mm -hmm. So that yeah. I think. Other than the informants that were assigned in the wave. He did give some people cards that said they were informants, right? Yes, he did. However, more people were informants. In fact, there were right. so many informants, it really freaked him out. He said, oh my <laughs> goodness. I, he, he started to get all this information, personal information, information about conversations between students and their parents even. I mean, and... It, a lot. I mean, he was freaked out by this whole thing, um, mm -hmm. but that was very interesting that they did that. And he also um, did assign each student a verbal a verbal action that they were going to take. So some were informants, yes, but others were, and um, you know, the, obviously the bodyguard and the Gestapo. That was <laughs> that was part of it too. Although he didn't assign those, but he did assign. Okay, you're going to make a poster, and you're going to um, give me all the names and addresses of every student involved, and you're going to be in charge of enlisting and that kind of thing. Right, so, right. Yeah, he did have everyone involved. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so <clears throat> I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, so we're just going to give some 
of our initial thoughts uh, upon learning about the third wave. Um, and this is interesting. In the documentary, they imply that the kids already saw him as a mentor figure. So, and a quote is, he commanded the class like a skilled actor. So he was very... He was a very charismatic teacher. Uh, all the students loved to be in his class in the first place. So he didn't need to win them over. They were already won over. Um, so they were ripe to go along with whatever he said. And especially because his teaching style, he called experience, or not just him, it was, it was a big thing back then. It's experiential teaching. And... Um, his style was he would teach through simulation. So every lesson that they taught, he would come up with a way to show the kids instead of just teach them, show them through interaction and through group learning and role playing, that kind of thing. So to them, this was just a normal thing, right? They, they loved this class because of it, but they didn't, they didn't suspect anything out of the ordinary because this was ordinary for his class. And I think this is important because it, sh it sort of emphasizes that not everyone can do this. It has to be, for, for somebody to be a successful leader, they must be a charismatic uh, person that people admire. Um, so that's, he definitely had that. Um, and so uh, there was a clear emphasis on community being greater than the individual, I noticed. Uh, it was mainly the, the documentary lesson plan that brought this out more than anything. Um, it was said over and over in various ways, the community is greater than the individual. And, uh, and I, this was sort of introduced on the second day. The first day they just did drills, but the second day was, you know, strength through community, and this is when the kids started to become violent. Uh, they they took that and they became they they projected that outward and and showed violence toward anybody who was not of their community. Um, and this is also a, a sort of a collectivist philosophy. So I'm seeing this as an as an experiment in collectivism more than maybe any particular uh, political philosophy. I know they, they say fascism, some say you know totalitarianism, um, but it's, it's sort of collectivism across the board and, mm -hmm. and that really stands out to me. Uh, and the students involved, um, interestingly, seemed really grateful for the lesson, even now, today. Um, they're saying, I'm really glad I was there. I learned a lot. I, I, you know, wouldn't give it up for the world, even though they felt such guilt and they couldn't talk about it for a long time. It really taught them a very valuable lesson. Um, but the teacher seemed to have a little bit of a different opinion about it. Um, and he really, he felt really responsible because it was, it was dangerous. He, I don't think he realized that when he first started it, but he said it, it, that he feels it would be too dangerous to ever do again for anybody mm -hmm. to ever do this again. Um, so and that was probably awesome. a little unethical, being that it was in a compulsory schooling setting too. Absolutely. To redo, to do that again in that setting would be unethical. I think probably in his mind too. Mm -hmm. their captive audience. Yes. Yeah. And that I, was... You know. mm -hmm. Okay. That's good. So, um, you know, the first time that I watched the German version of the film, I was really blown away by it. I was very surprised uh, that it was based on a true story, and I had never heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, in the movie, the teacher outlined some of the conditions that led to the German people being ripe for the Third Reich economic hardship, the defeated attitude of the Germans after World War I, and then here comes a charismatic leader that promises to end all that. Um, and I couldn't help but see the parallels in the classroom. Ron Jones was the charismatic leader, and grades were the currency. And there were some students that had maybe felt less successful in school, and here they were given this opportunity to be part of this group, to belong, and have some success. Um, they were promised A's, like we said, if they united and gave their all to the project, and they were united around a central sense of pride in the work that they were accomplishing through all this new discipline. 
kids were really excited about it. Uh, the compulsory schooling is an important aspect to consider when asking how this could happen. Our modern education model is based on the Prussian model of compulsory schooling. The education that Germans had been steeped in is an important aspect to understanding how Hitler rose to power. That You just cannot ignore that. Um, and so I'd also like to point out that there's a similarity in the behavior of the girl that spoke out against Ron Jones' WAVE project and Sophie Scholl from the White Roses. If you haven't heard of her, you definitely would want to check out. Uh, there's a great movie, The Final Days, Sophie Scholl, The Final Days. I'll definitely put a link in the bottom of this. Um, but she um, spoke out. She knew. She definitely knew that her life was on the line for her activities, speaking out against the Nazis. She and her um, group called the White Roses, they distributed leaflets speaking out about the Nazis, um, and she paid dearly for it. Um, and I came across a quote from Lillian Garrett Grogue. She wrote in Newsday on February 22, 1993, about Sophie Scholl. She said that it's possibly the most spectacular moment of resistance that I can think of in the 20th century. The fact that five little kids in the mouth of the wolf, where it really counted, had the tremendous courage to do what they did is spectacular to me. And I know that the world is better for have them having been there, but I do not know why. Which I think is interesting because I definitely think I know why. Yes. Um, <laughs> I think it's so important. And it's, it's incredible that there are people that will speak out um, no matter what. Mm -hmm. they, they see, you know, uh, the world could use more Sophie Scholes. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, their conclusion, we're going to talk a little bit about their conclusion. The, their, I mean, you know, the students and the teachers, basically, you know, Ron Jones and Philip Zimbardo. Um, and most of them, and even in the Wikipedia page, it says it was human nature, uh, that this is in us all, that uh, we're just a charismatic leader away from being led like this. Um, Philip Zimbardo said that he, some people see the world as a dichotomy between jailer and prisoner and that most people, ch because of this, most people want to be the jailer, the person in power. They, they don't want to be the, the prisoner, right, for obvious reasons. Um, so that was, you know, they don't really have much of a conclusion besides that. It's kind of this is fascism, this is this is totalitarianism. Uh, you know, that was kind of it. So that's you know what I had from that. Sorry, I've uh, watched a TED talk by Philip Zimbardo. And he talks a lot about his research, and he talks about it being the barrel, not the apples. But there are no bad apples, just bad barrels. And I think that's important and interesting. So, you know, there's always going to be the people, the outliers, that will speak out, no matter what, I think, I hope. But there are people that, you know, they're not, it's not that they're bad, um, it's that they, in the right situation, might behave badly, or their ends may be bad. Um, so I can't help but see the capacity for good and bad is alive in most of us. Uh, with the proper conditions, most, most people could be swayed into groupthink and behave in this way. We see it all around us in varying degrees, and it's especially present in situations that have certain conditions, like a charismatic authority figure, um, I think this is largely true. We as humans are capable of both good and evil, and sometimes our intentions confuse our actions. Absolutely. So. Yeah. So um, we just wanted to give a little bit. That that was sort of their conclusion, and we wanted to add to that our conclusion. Um, and there is no single or definite conclusion to take away from this. Uh, there's a lot more to study. There's a lot to think about. Uh, so we encourage you guys, our audience, to come to your own conclusions. Check this out. You know, see what you think. It's it's a lot to wrap your mind around. Um, to me, it's a clear example of that quote that I'm sure we've all heard by Christian. 
Krishnamurti, um, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a sick society. And that's because I think it goes deeper than just being manipulated by this charismatic teacher. I think that that we have to be sort of, what's the word for it, um, primed for this type of behavior, that our culture does prime us for this behavior. Our, and, and specifically, the, the common parenting style that we have here and there at the time, um, and our, our schooling, both, both are Prussian, by the way. So um, I wanted to read a passage by Alice Miller, who is an author, and she works extensively in this particular topic about parenting and, um, and what this uh, means. And this is from an article called The Political Consequences of Child Abuse. And there's a lot. We'll link this in the bottom, too, because um, I could just read the whole thing, and it would be totally relevant. Um, but I, 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 saw, I found this interesting part, and it, it goes, uh, Benjamin Wilmorski, the author of a harrowing and intensely illuminating book about this childhood in the concentration camps, once confided to me in a personal encounter some observations he made with the eyes of an imprisoned but extremely wide-awake child on the behavior of the female camp guards. He said that it had taken him 50 years to inquire who those blokovas really were. Blokovas is what they were called. Um, those women who had so openly and unreservedly relished the job of tormenting and humiliating Jewish children and subjecting them to every conceivable variety of mental and physical cruelty. Uh, to his astonishment, pursuit of the trial records revealed that most of them were young women between ages 19 and 21 who had formerly had quite ordinary jobs as seamstresses or sales clerks and whose biographies contained nothing in any way unusual. During the trial, they unanimously claimed that they had not been aware that the Jewish children were human beings. The conclusion that immediately suggests itself from this is that ultimately propaganda and manipulation are sufficient to transform people into st sadistic executioners and mass murderers. This is not an opinion I share. On the contrary, it is my belief that only men and women who had experienced mental and physical cruelty in the first, in the first weeks and months of life and had been shown no love at all all could possibly have let themselves be made into Hitler's willing executioners. As Goldhagen's archive material shows, they needed next to no ideological indoctrination because their bodies knew exactly what they wanted to do as soon as they were allowed to follow their inclinations. And as the Jews, young or old, had been declared non-persons, there was nothing to stop them indulging those inclinations. But no amount of indoctrination alone at school or wherever will unleash hatred in a person who has no preconditions in that direction. It is well known that there were also Germans like Karl Jaspers, Hermann Hesse, or Thomas Mann who immediately recognized the declaration that Jews were non-persons as an alarm signal and the rallying cry of untrammeled barbarism. So what she's saying, and, and I agree with her, I mean it's not a complete conclusion, but this goes deeper than just, you know, here's a charismatic guy in class that we should follow. I really think that people are conditioned into this behavior when it shows up to them, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, you know, through parenting, uh, you know, hitting your kids at an early age, this uh, extreme discipline, which was what Hitler was very into, um, and even, I mean, this took a couple generations before Hitler came to power. So uh, a few generations before Hitler came to power, they, they implemented this sort of Prussian parenting style, mm -hmm. and which it was very uh, lots, big on discipline, big on denial of gratification for children. They couldn't cry. You, you know, it, it was sort of just show, being cruel to, to excite a rage in them. And you know this mm -hmm. this was intended to create violent people. So all they needed was that spark, and and that came right out. And I think to a lesser extent, that's that's what's going on in this particular experiment, and and in our lives today. 
Absolutely, so. absolutely. And I just wanted to speak to um, the one girl that was portrayed in the movie, The Wave, uh, the German, the German version of the of the story. She had different parenting um, in the movie, which I I personally love that they decided to portray her. I don't know what the actual girl. I think her parents were more open and. It seemed like that from the documentary, but it was definitely portrayed that way in the German version of the movie, that her parents really wanted her to form her own conclusions and find her own um, her own way. So I think that that's great that they, that they portrayed that that way. Um, and I'd also just like to end with one last quote regarding parenting uh, by Alfie Cohen, the author of Unconditional Parenting. I'm a big fan of that book. Um, so the dominant problem with parenting in our society isn't permissiveness, but the fear of permissiveness. Yeah, that's perfect. That's yeah, true. yeah. Um, so if this was interesting to you, please check out all the links and explore this subject for yourself. Uh, there's just too much to cover in a short video, and there's so many other places you could go to explore the ideas that were presented in this this movie and this experiment. Um, so you can join us every Saturday morning on the Voluntary Virtues Network from 7 to 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. And it's been another interesting chat, Meredith. Yes, thank you, Sarah. And we'll see you next time. Okay. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.